On January 15th, 1919, an over two million gallon tank of molasses ripped apart in Boston's North End. The disaster launched a 25 foot tall tsunami traveling 35 miles per hour. The wave of molasses went in every direction. It collapsed buildings, flooded homes, and trapped people in their steps instantly. When it was all over, 21 people died and another 150 were injured. So why was there even a giant tank of molasses in the city to begin with? And how did this slow, dense, and honestly boring liquid cause so much destruction? The North End is Boston's oldest neighborhood. It's famous for its historical landmarks, Italian community, and food. And in 1919, it was also home to the Purity Distilling Company, owned by U.S. Industrial Alcohol. Purity Distilling was in the business of turning molasses into alcohol, specifically rum. But booze wasn't the only thing on their mind. Most of that alcohol was actually going to be used to make explosives. But more on that later. All right, so you probably know molasses as one of the ingredients in your grandmother's famous cookies. But do you know where it comes from? It's actually the liquid byproduct of making granulated sugar from sugarcane. This involves pressing sugarcane stalks to extract the juice and then boiling it down until crystallized sugar forms. Once the sugar is removed, the leftover liquid is a light molasses, which is then boiled down again to give it its signature thick, dark brown look. The heat causes the sugars inside to decompose and caramelize. This produces complex mixtures of shorter and longer chains of sugar molecules, which give molasses its dark brown color. Now, molasses is mostly sugar and water, with traces of other stuff like amino acids, which makes it the perfect food for bacteria and fungi to ferment into alcohol. To create alcohol, distilleries add microorganisms like yeast, which is actually a fungus, to the molasses. Then, the yeast converts the sugars into alcohol and carbon dioxide through fermentation. For the most common sugars, like sucrose and glucose, the fermentation reaction looks something like this. The yeast breaks the sugar up into two ethanol molecules and two carbon dioxide molecules. The carbon dioxide is formed as a gas and bubbles out of the mixture. So this reaction looks neat and tidy, right? Just ethanol and CO2. Well, in reality, this reaction is happening in a big pot full of molasses, a complex mixture with a whole lot of other stuff in it. And the yeast can only produce so much alcohol before it dies off. At around 5 to 20% concentration, the ethanol begins to strip the cell membranes off of the yeast, effectively killing it. When the fermentation reaction is complete, you have a lot of stuff left over from the molasses and the yeast that you don't want. What you do want is pure ethanol. This is the alcohol that beverages like beer, wine, vodka, and moonshine all have in common. But to get the pure ethanol, you have to distill it from the rest of the fermentation mixture. To do this, you heat up the fermented mixture to around 80 degrees Celsius, which is just above the boiling point of ethanol. At this point, the alcohol evaporates from the mixture, turning into a gas. The water and much of the other stuff we don't want in our alcohol is left behind because its boiling point is much higher at 100 degrees Celsius. The ethanol vapor rises above the liquid and then condenses in a series of tubes, where it cools and once again becomes a liquid. A company might distill the condensed vapor several times to purify the liquid even further until they have a product that is almost entirely ethanol. Another product of fermentation is methanol, and methanol can be deadly. Luckily, methanol has a boiling point that's significantly lower than ethanol, meaning it will evaporate and distill out of the mixture first. And it's only produced in really small amounts in typical fermentation. But manufacturers have to be careful to remove it from the final product because drinking even small amounts can make you go blind or even kill you. Now, a portion of the Purity Distilling Company's alcohol was bottled as rum, and people were stocking up. The 18th Amendment, which began the era of prohibition, was set to go into effect in 1920, just one year after the molasses flood. But the majority of the company's alcohol was used to make explosives like dynamite and smokeless powder. This is just what it sounds like, an explosive powder like gunpowder that produces almost no smoke. And they needed a lot of alcohol to make it. It took one liter of alcohol to manufacture every pound of smokeless powder. And the Allies went through millions of pounds of explosives during World War I. And to satisfy the demand for lots of explosives, the Purity Distilling Company needed a lot of molasses to make a lot of alcohol. So in 1915, they built a gigantic tank in Boston. 50 feet high and 90 feet across. It could hold more than 2 million gallons of molasses. 
Ships from Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the West Indies filled the tank with molasses, which would then be shipped by rail cars to the nearby processing plant for fermentation. Now, the tank's construction had a lot of problems. Molasses could actually be seen leaking through its seams, but instead of fixing the problem, the tank was simply painted a rust brown to match the color of the leaking molasses. And the company kept using the tank in spite of these sticky warning signs, caulking leaks and carrying on as though nothing was wrong. But then, in January 1919, things went wrong. Over half a million gallons of molasses from the Caribbean were pumped into the tank, a tank that already contained over 1.5 million gallons that had been sitting through the Boston winter, filling it to its maximum capacity. We still can't know for sure exactly what happened to cause the tank to fail that day, but an MIT professor who studied the wreckage shortly after the disaster found that the tank was simply too weak to hold the full load. In fact, the steel used to construct the tank was only half the thickness it should have been for a tank that size. When the tank burst on January 15th, 1919, steel and rivets were launched into nearby buildings. But much more destructive was the nearly 26 million pounds of molasses rushing into the streets of Boston. Estimates put the initial wave at 25 feet high, traveling 35 miles per hour in every direction. The molasses ripped buildings from their foundations, crushed cars and wagons, and trapped people and animals in the aftermath. So let's try and recreate this. Here we have our tiny model of the Boston Harbor and a jar of molasses. This is a big mess, but doesn't look all that destructive, right? Well, pictures and evidence of the aftermath tell a different story. So what made the tank of molasses so deadly? And how did such a simple liquid cause so much destruction? People have talked about the disaster for years, but it wasn't until recently that anyone studied the fluid dynamics of the disaster. But in 2016, Dr. Nicole Sharp and her collaborators, Jordan Kennedy and Dr. Shmuel Rubenstein, decided to look into the physics of it, and they discovered that the wave was a form of gravity current. Gravity or density currents happen when there are two fluids of different densities next to each other, both under the influence of gravity. You can see that here with these two liquids. On the left, we have plain water, and on the right, we have more dense sugar water. If I remove the wall between these two, the more dense sugar water exerts more pressure on the newly created opening than the plain water, causing it to flow underneath as it settles downwards due to gravity. In the molasses flood, the two fluids are the more dense molasses and the much less dense air. Sharp and Kennedy studied what these gravity flows look like for molasses, and how the viscosity of molasses, or its resistance to changing shape, is influenced by pressure. For many fluids, their viscosity remains the same, no matter how much force is applied. These are Newtonian fluids. Their viscosity can be changed, however, by things like temperature. Traditional car oil is an example of a Newtonian fluid. It might be hard to try and start your car on a cold day, because the cold, thick oil will be highly viscous. But once the car warms up the oil, it will flow more freely through your engine as it becomes less viscous. But temperature isn't the only thing that can change the viscosity of some fluids. These are non-Newtonian fluids, and molasses is one of them. Non-Newtonian fluids change their viscosity in response to applied force. You might be familiar with the non-Newtonian fluid, oobleck. This is just cornstarch and water. It flows like a liquid when no stress is applied, but it becomes much firmer when I ramp up the force like this. So we call oobleck a sheer thickening fluid. There are a few types of non-Newtonian fluids, and molasses is a sheer thinning fluid. Unlike oobleck, shear thinning fluids get less viscous as more stress is applied to them. This may have helped the molasses to rush out of the tank and act like a much thinner liquid. This type of behavior sometimes appears in fluids that have lots of long molecules which get tangled together, making the fluid viscous. But once a force is applied, those molecules start to untangle and slide past one another, lowering the viscosity. The gigantic amount of molasses in the tank created lots of pressure pushing down on the molasses towards the bottom. This could have contributed to shear thinning, faster flowing behavior. But how much of an impact did this have on the flood? Dr. Sharp and her colleagues calculated that the temperatures in the Boston winter likely had a bigger impact on the viscosity than the shear thinning behavior. Lowering the temperature of molasses from just 10 degrees Celsius to zero degrees Celsius makes it three times more viscous. And of course that means raising the temperature can make it much less viscous. You can see that here. This molasses on the left is at room temperature around 25 degrees Celsius, and this one on the right that I just pulled out of the refrigerator is around 20 degrees lower. 
You can see just how much more viscous and thick the colder one is as I try to pour it. The freshly delivered molasses in the tank was about five degrees warmer than the surrounding air. This warm molasses was less viscous and more fluid than colder molasses would have been. Another potential reason why this molasses might have flown so freely from the burst tank. But once it hit the cold Boston air, it cooled and became way more viscous and hard. People who were trapped in the molasses tide suddenly found themselves stuck and rescuers had no way to reach them. And we haven't even talked about the enormous amount of potential energy stored in that tank yet. The four story tank with molasses stacked atop itself was potential energy just waiting to be released. In fact, the wave was so strong, it bent the steel beams holding up a train track, luckily missing a train that had just passed moments earlier. We can estimate just how much potential energy there was in that tank. Let's split the tank up into one meter chunks and calculate each one's potential energy individually. For the top meter, we can calculate the volume of molasses in that layer by multiplying pi times the radius squared times the height, which gives us 590 meters cubed. By multiplying that volume times the density of molasses at room temp, we can see that it weighed 826,000 kilograms, a little over 910 tons. We can then calculate the potential energy by multiplying the mass by the acceleration of gravity by the change in height. So at a height of around 14 meters off the ground, the potential energy of this layer was around 113 million joules. If we do this for the entire tank, we get a total potential energy of around 850 million joules. That's nearly as much energy as there is in 850 sticks of dynamite. From the photos, we can see just how much energy all of that molasses had when it was released. It took several days just to recover the dead bodies under the tons of spilled molasses, and one wasn't found until four months later. Firefighters used seawater to cut through the hardened molasses, which then ran back down into the harbor, turning it brown for weeks. The disaster resulted in the longest court case at that point in Massachusetts history, which seemed like a never-ending circus. U.S. Industrial even tried to claim that the disaster was the result of an anarchist who blew up its tank. But in the end, the company was found liable for the collapse of the tank and had to pay $628,000 in damages, which would be over $9 million today. After this case, the United States set into motion a number of new laws and construction standards to prevent a similar disaster from happening in the future. The disaster is so notorious in Boston lore that some people will swear you can still smell the faint aroma of molasses on a hot summer day.